Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Today, we have uh, two special guests. And uh, if you've been checking out any of my YouTube stuff, which almost nobody has, you already know about Coach Hahn and Mr. Sam Holman. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of work with our um, Chalk Wars, which is a really fun segment. And I'm hoping we can kind of figure out. And I mean, the Packers are done, but we don't really have to stop ever if we don't want to. So if you guys ever want to do that again, uh, we can do that. But um, Coach Hahn has been on the podcast before. Sam has not yet. But um, both of these guys are, I guess, what you would call film guys. So they're going to be able to provide a little bit of context that um, I attempt to on the podcast, but I don't, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, which is why I tell you that up front. I don't really know. I'm just kind of guessing, but, um, I did solicit a few questions from Patreon. So we're going to be able to go through and look at a few things that you were uh, curious about from that particular aspect. We'll cover some of the painful things that, uh, they saw as far as the game and, um, maybe get a little bit of a rosy outlook as far as, um, some of the things we can do to build into the future. Uh, but guys, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. I appreciate that. How are you guys doing? Great, man. Excited as always to be here with you and Sam and just talking some ball. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here too. This is kind of my first experience uh, getting on a podcast, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and Sam, uh, if you could let, let the, the folks know where they can find you. I know you're just kind of, although you're bursting onto the scene, I think you're still relatively new to the people out there. So let them know where they can find you. Yeah, so on my main kind of place where I like to hang out is uh, Twitter at Sam underscore D Holman. Um, I do have a YouTube channel that I'm probably going to be putting some videos up on, just some video breakdowns, getting into that type of thing. Um, channel is just titled Samuel Holman dash Wisconsin Sports Heroics. And tying into that, I also write for Wisconsin Sports, Sports Heroics, so you can have it over there for all your Wisconsin sports needs. Fantastic. All right. Well, I don't want to take up too much of you guys' time, so we're going to try to fly through this as quickly as we possibly can. But uh, Sam and, and Coach, if you had looked at it at all, feel free to chime in. But I did have one question. The, there's a lot of new things going on in the offseason, not just with the Packers, with some other teams. But uh, the Chicago Bears did hire Mr. Eberflus from the Colts. Um, and I don't know too much about them, but obviously I want to keep my finger on the pulse of what the Bears are doing and kind of get a, a, an idea of where they're headed. And uh, it does seem to me, from what I can tell from a very layman standpoint, that this is a little bit of a different direction that they're going in terms of the, the um, style of defense. And I, I guess I'm curious, first of all, what kind of a defense uh, could you summarize that he likes to run? But also, um, do you think they can take this Fangio defense and just say, let's run it? Or are you thinking that we might need to do a little bit of a rebuild in a new direction yeah so I think this is gonna be a pretty new direction for the Bears defense it's not really in the Fangio style or tree um I watched two games from this year uh, I think week one against the Seahawks and then week 11 against the Bills I didn't have time for more than that but what I saw they play a lot more one high defense than the Bears did this year and they did it uh, with Fangio they do get into it in pretty interesting ways they spin their safeties a lot. So that could be a cause for concern. That's kind of some of the stuff that Aaron Rodgers has struggled against. And obviously we don't really know if Jordan Love is going to struggle against that. I would assume he would just because that's a tough, tough scheme for quarterbacks to go against. They do like to send pressure a lot on passing downs um, from what I saw. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that from what I've heard about the Colts defense in past years, they've been a lot more conservative. Then when some of their quarterback play wasn't up to snuff, um, they just kind of play more, more in that too high tree, just prevent defense a little bit. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they do. And then one other thing, Matt Eberflus is actually, I think he's been a linebackers coach a couple times in his career. And one thing I noticed when I was watching him with the Colts is he really liked to, to move Darius Leonard around, play him at the Mike linebacker, Sam backer, just get, get him all over the field and let him disrupt. So that could this could be a scheme where Rokon Smith really starts to shine. Yeah, and 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 obviously I know I had watched a couple of videos of him and some of his things, and he went right to the linebackers as well. Um, I'm sure he's gonna love having a guy like Roquan in his defense. And I think the one guy that that I can't get out of my head that that seemed a little bit out of place. I know he's an absolute freak of a um, football player, but Khalil Mack 
has been, I mean, he's a, he's a stand up outside linebacker. And I know um, they have uh, Robert Quinn, who's played both as a hand in the dirt defensive end, as well as an outside linebacker. So it's probably not that big of a switch for him, but I'm wondering about specifically that aspect of it. And I, I know there's three, four and four, three are, are a little bit more interchangeable these days than they used to be, but I'm just wondering with that in particular, it, it, do you think it's um, kind of, I don't know the word dogmatic or whatever, in terms of they do four down linemen and that's what they do. Or do you think that Khalil is going to be able to stand up in this defense and they'll, they'll find a role for him in that way? I, I think they're going to stick to four down. Um, I mean, as I said, they have adjusted to their personnel in the past, so they could, I could see them switching or sticking with a four or a, a three, four, but I would expect them to go to four down. I think I saw, I saw them play like a, a three, four style defense, maybe twice in the two games I watched and one of them was like a specialized passing down front. So I, I think they're going to stick with four down um, with the switch. I don't know. I'm not a NFL coach, right. so I can't say for sure, but I would imagine that switching from a three, four outside backer to a four, three defensive end would probably be pretty easy. In fact, you're, if anything, you're simplifying the assignments because that end is not going to have to drop any coverage as much anymore. Makes sense. All right, we'll get off the Bears. It's just something to kind of keep our eye on and and just kind of see what direction they're heading in. They've got some more hirings to do, as do the Packers. But I want to get into the the questions now we got from our patrons here. Um, Several questions that came up, obviously most of them about the game. But I want to start off with Jorgen. He says, what was it with the offense that failed in our last game? Why did it seem as if everything stalled after the first drive? So I don't know, Coach, if you want to maybe start off with this one. Oh, yeah, baby, my turn. Um, (laughs) A couple of things that I noticed right off the bat, I'll try to keep it as concise as possible. The really um, impressive thing to me from San Fran and the really tough thing for Green Bay is just how much pressure they got with four down. You know, if you're able to get pressure with four down linemen, that means you're one up in coverage. You're dropping seven. You're able to shadow guys. It takes away a lot of that check down stuff um, that can go big. The one time we saw a bust in the coverage, they were banjoing the back. Uh, San Fran was Aaron Jones was able to leak out on a miscommunication, go 75 yards, lead to a field goal. Right. So that's a big part of what Green Bay does. But if you're getting substantial pressure with four and you're able to banjo one of those backs, it's going to take away a lot of what the the Packers like to do both stretching the field on one half and then getting some of that quick game on the other half. So that was a tough thing. The other one that just kind of rings true to me is um, Green Bay's inability to get anything going on first and second down. You know, you're everybody says third down is the money down, right? And I, I, I get the thought process, but to me, first down is the money down. Like you have to get positive yards on first down. You have to stay away from third and long. So third and eight plus is what I call third and long. And if you look at their, you know, 10 opportunities and third down, you got five or six of them that are third and long, you know, and, and it just plays right into the defense's hand. Um, just kind of like what Sam was saying earlier about Ebert flu. So th- those two things really, really kind of um, stuck out to me. And then I just, I, um, I've, I've heard oftentimes that the play calling got a little conservative in the second half. I disagree wildly. Um, I thought it was a little, possibly even a little aggressive. I wanted to see them run the ball more. I thought they had something really nice going on those first couple of drives. Um, when you had some condensed formations, you had some edge attacks, you know, you had these different looks where you, you could really pack San Fran in the box and push them around a little bit. So the ability to get uh, pressure from four, the inability to, to stop shooting yourself in the foot and getting yourself into third and long situations. And the fact that, you know, by and large, they kind of stopped running the football. I think um, in a nutshell is what happened. Yeah, Sam, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that as well. No, I, I completely agree. Like coach said, um, I, I, I mean, I'll, I don't know if he agrees with this, but I, I did notice a pretty strong vertical attack that they were trying to get to. Um, it makes me wonder, honestly, if they they really anticipated Bakhtiari playing and so kind of game planned around that, wanted to test those corners deep. But yeah, they just, once they weren't able to stay on schedule, whether it was drops, you know, Aaron Rodgers getting to the check down a little bit late, whatever whatever it was, yeah, they, they just had trouble putting anything together. So moving on here, Goose had a question. He says, how much benefit would a Kittle slash Andrews level tight end help this oh. offense open up? Oh, 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 oh. I mean, that's not fair, right? That's <laughs> not fair. You put a weapon like that. I mean, we see what Bob 
Tunyon does um, and what he brings to Green Bay. And don't get me wrong, Tunyon's not Kittle. <laughs> Tunyon's not Andrews, right? right? I mean, the, the way that Kittle blocks and the pride he takes in blocking and then his his attack down the field, like, don't get me wrong, but that would that would just be not fair. That's you're creating a team on Madden. You know, that's just if, if you get that level of guy, um, it would be a huge help. But I mean, Mercedes Lewis has done some stuff in the trenches. DeGuara, I know he had a, a big drop or whatever. Like, I get that. But you, you got dudes who can do it. And Tanya and hopefully coming back and whatever goes there. You got dudes who can do it. And I think eventually you got to just start picking your, you know, with a salary cap, you can't be this dream team. You got to start picking your, your positions and, you know, left tackle to me and then center and then quarterback and then just a stud receiver. And if, if you only get to prioritize four, those would be my four. Yeah, I would agree. So got a long one here from Nevin. So just bear with me here as I try to uh, attempt to read. One thing that bothers me about the offense this year is how much the offense has been lining up in the shotgun, even in short yardage and goal line situations. The reason I don't like it is because I feel it limits not only production from the run game, but also the threat of the run pre-snap. Basically running the ball out of the shotgun gives the defense more time to react. And due to the defense knowing this, they don't feel as threatened by the run pre-snap. What are your thoughts on that? Also, are they doing this because of Rodgers? Um, they seem to have Jordan Love lining up under center more in the Detroit game. So if either of you have any thoughts on that, let me know. Yeah, that's a fair question. And one you, you hear a lot, you know, my high school team, we're, we're primarily shotgun as well. Um, the reason we do it, and I'm sure the reason Green Bay does it, because we run a similar scheme to them, is when you come out of shotgun and you come from a depth of five, you know, you have the ability to read a little bit. You know, um, Green Bay is pretty heavy on RPO stuff, really hard to RPO from under center. Those reads get clouded up. But really, the reason we do it is it tempos up the run game better. If you're going to run a zone scheme, you've got to let some of those guys insert so that your blocks can develop to them. You need that, that backside inside backer to start to insert and pick his gap. A lot of defenses now um, aren't just a gap sound. They're more of a flow type of defense. So the backside inside backer could be responsible for backside A gap flowing to the top of play side C. So as that running back crosses the face of the quarterback, he's kind of keying on, on somebody. However, their scheme is set up to see, is he flowing over the top to B gap? Cool. I'm going to cut it back. Is he inserting? I'm going to pound it ahead. It just tempos up better. Um, and it also allows for a lot of the glance, a lot of the RPO, and it allows the quarterback to see the defense a heck of a lot better. It's tough to see the alignment of an outside backer when you're under center and it allows for a little bit more audible stuff. Yeah, and I will throw in, you know, whatever failings the run game has had this year, um, I think that's been more due to, like, the injuries along the offensive line than anything schematic with, you know, under center versus shotgun. Just, I mean, I, I like Lucas Patrick, but he was not great at run blocking at center. Um, and, yeah, there's just there's just been issues, especially along that interior and the right side a little bit all year. Got a question from Chris. He says, our opponents seem to be able to find tight ends and running backs open in the short middle of the field for first downs. Meanwhile, Rodgers has frequently avoided throwing to the middle of the field. Is that because of our scheme, because of Rodgers, or because of some other reason, such as higher interception rates in that area? Uh, I can't give you the true reasoning behind it as, you know, there's very few people on this planet that actually know the true reason as to why that's not being attacked. Um, but I will say this, you know, schematically in a vertical, vertical stretch game, if you're getting pressure with four um, and, and dropping seven into coverage, whether you're holding a, a, a four high shell or you're in cover two or two man or whatever, a lot of times those throws aren't there. So a lot of times it boils down. The old old line coach in me says it boils down to protection. Like if you can protect four, yeah, you're going to get all sorts of fun stuff. But if you're getting pressure from four and you're allowed to have a robber in there, if you're allowed to have an attached banjo type of guy in there, um, that, that gets tough. Yeah. And just to kind of speak from a defensive side, when you can, like coach said, get pressure with four, stop the run with a light box that frees you up a lot to get more resources into the middle of the field. Um, that's the, the advantage. One of the advantages of those Fangio like quarters defenses is the safeties can play a little bit more flat footed where they can come down on those in breakers, those digs, that kind of thing. And just, close those down that's why it's so that's why it's kind of come into vogue a little bit is it directly counteracts a lot of the middle of field passing attacks that the like the shanahan tree guys like to uh get into 
So we got kind of a two-parter here from Edward, and, and maybe this is a bit of a coach question, but it says, at what point in the game does one figure out what the opponent has decided to do? And uh, beyond that, who is it that decides what cor course correction to take and when do they usually do those corrections? Yeah, that is an awesome question. It really kind of boils down to how good your guys are around you. You know, at the end of the day, the coordinators are going to have the, the final call. But if you got a quality analyst guy, you got a QA dude whose sole job is to watch when we go to 11 personnel, what is their outside backer alignment? And are they going to go ahead and stem to a six or are we going to stay in a five tech or what are we seeing? Um, it all depends on how sharp those guys are. Green Bay, all the way up until this point, has done it, you know, the first drive or two. Uh, I think back to that last Minnesota game where it's everybody's frustrated because the first two drives are, you know, it's three nothing or, or whatever it is. You know, you get a field goal out of two drives. Everybody's frustrated. Then all of a sudden there's an offensive explosion, right? And it's just like four or five straight drives where you're scoring on. Um, up until this point, Green Bay has done a great job of that. And to San Fran's credit, uh, the last game we played or the last game we saw, they did a great job of mixing it up. They showed a ton of sim pressure, right? They always had six around the line um, available to come, which really kind of hamstrings what your offense line, offensive line can do for protection. And then they've just traditionally been bailing them out and bringing four. And then uh, the one time they do bring six, Green Bay actually, I thought, picked it up pretty well, um, except for your left guard attached the wrong way, in my opinion. Um, and then there was pressure, so. So, uh, Doug, I'm going to skip your second question because we kind of touched on it. However, uh, his first question says, why is it we take a dive when playing certain teams like the Niners? Is it a lack of ability such as our offensive line or Lowry or Rodgers? Did the weather have a big factor or did they just plain suck in this game? Sam, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think like Coach has touched on a couple times, it's just that that issue with getting pressure with four allows you to play with more recess, resources in the back end. Um, I think there have been, like the coaching, I, I wouldn't say like the game, the, the calls that the offense is making that they're trying to get into are necessarily bad, but they aren't great either, I would say. Um, on the defensive side, I, I think the only part he mentioned that kind of pertains to that is Lowry. Um, Lowry, he's he's all right. Uh, in this game, you know, he was matched up a lot with 71, Trent Williams, their left tackle, who's just an absolute monster. Like, he he just destroys everyone. And so that, that can kind of paint a little bit more of a negative picture than he might facing another, than it might facing another tackle. But, you know, he, he is what he is. He can give you some pass rush. He can, you know, string some plays out at like a three tech, but you, know, you can always upgrade at that position. Yeah. I'm actually going to kind of step outside my comfort zone on this one a little bit and, and not talk scheme um, and just talk from a coach and, and the way we see it, you know, we're, we're all human. Uh, Packers players are human. Their front office is human. Their coaching staff is human. So are the Niners. And I got to say from experience, you know, there's one team in our conference that no matter how good we are consistently gives us trouble, whether we're really good and they're really bad or they're really good and we're really bad. We play each other like it's the Super Bowl. And honestly, I think that's kind of San Fran for Green Bay and has been for the last 15 years or so where it's like, oh, no, it's a big game. It's San Fran. And I guarantee you, it doesn't matter who the head coach is, doesn't matter who the guys are on the roster. They know that history. They know that path pass from both sides. So as a coach, I've caught myself doing it many times. You try to do too much. You try to put it all on it. This is on my shoulders. You know, I've got to make every call perfect. I'm staying up until 2 a.m., you know, the night before, overwhelming the kids, that sort of stuff. It could certainly happen with Rodgers. You know, it could certainly happen. There is a mental aspect of that. It exists. I wish I could say that we're all robots and we're just schematically programmed, but that's not the case, right? So I do think there's a little bit of that. Schematically, the game was fine. This is a game that Green Bay wins against every other team in the league with the scheme that they brought in. Um, it's just sometimes there's that mental roadblock that's, and it, it's not like me to go there, right? Because I'm like, well, your left tackle was not good, which by the way, not great. You know, so like at the end of the day, there is still that kind of mental element of, you know, this is that tough team that's always going to come out and play stuff. 
So we got one okay. final question. And oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, I was just going to ask, Coach, I mean, I don't know what your guys' opinion on this is, but do you think that – see, see, kind of where I'm coming from is I wonder if, you know, if Rodgers gets traded or whatever or decides to retire, maybe that sort of mental reset helps this kind of issue a little bit. I mean, obviously, there's an obvious talent downgrade. No matter how good Jordan Love is, you know, this – whatever year he's going into, third year, he's not going to be good as a 16-year Hall of Fame quarterback. But that – like getting that new blood in could kind of give you that, that fresh mindset in facing these kind of games. I mean, it certainly could, you know, we're in a really unique position where we're graduating kids every four years, you know, we're, we're becoming a brand new team every year. We've got a new set of leaders, a new set of captains, a new set of whatever. And every four years, our team is completely different. Right. And there's still, for whatever reason, there's that, that almost that mindset. It's, it almost becomes a culture within your culture right? Of like, well, here comes team B and they are just going to play us tough. You know, um, it's a tough thing to break. And if you guys have suggestions on it, selfishly, I'll steal them. Cause, um, we got, we got to figure that out too. But I think it's just meeting that monster head on and being like, you know what, we're sick of this. We're not going to do too much. We're going to go out, we're playing our game against a nameless faceless opponent. Easier said than done, but I may add. <laughs> Our final question is going to be a special teams question. So if you guys are able to address it, let's do it. Uh, I know that's kind of a tough one, but based on your film study, was the speed of the snap an issue on the two block special teams plays? Was it our scheme? Both. I mean, bottom line, it's both. Um, if, if you're going to – essentially what San Fran did was, was dare you. You know, they're going to say, hey, if you have the ability and the cojones to run a fake here, we're going to come gap on sound, you know, and what are you going to do? Are you going to be able to attack that gap on sound and see it and run a fake? We don't think you will. They call the bluff, right? Um, so that's a, it's a tough thing to do. I mean, essentially, at some point in time, you just run out of guys on that side, right? But the snap speed, I know um, I'm speaking to JJ here. Uh, JJ's had an issue um, with long snappers in the past. Um Snap speed is tough. I mean, there's a reason these guys tend to specialize in one area to so get that ball back there, get an op time of one, one or less, you know, you're looking to get that thing back and get it out knowing that you can't block this thing for more than two seconds. So it's, it's, it was a great game plan by San Fran. Yeah. I don't really have anything to add. I, I don't focus on special teams a whole lot when I'm watching film. Um, but yeah, there were, there were obviously some, some mistakes in protection and that sort of thing that messed them up. All right, we're going to take a real quick break right here. When we come back on the other side, I kind of want to just do what I like to do, which is go through the roster, kind of position by position, just kind of hit it real quick, talk a little bit about what happened in the game, talk a little bit about where we should go in the future. But we'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hey, while we're breaking, can I kick my dogs out of this room here? Yes, go ahead and do that. <laughs> come on, Alex, come on. Come on. Sorry, they were getting a little <coughs> playful, and I know how they get when they're playful. Pretty soon it becomes very violent. So, Yeah, I had my dog in here on the last chalk war. I don't know if you could hear him. He was, he was moaning and groaning as he got comfy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Love it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's start off. We'll, we'll just, we'll, you know, you sh probably should save the best for last, but that's not how I operate. We're going to start with quarterback. We're going to talk about Aaron Rodgers. Um, and we're, I'm, I'm not going to let you guys beat around the bush. We're going to talk about this. <laughs> Tell me about Aaron Rodgers because he's been catching a ton of heat for this game um, between special teams and Aaron Rodgers. They, they bear probably 100% of the blame for this game. So from, when, from what you guys saw watching this, first and foremost, um, obviously he had a great season, MVP caliber season and all that. But in this particular game, certain things definitely seem to be off. We saw some of the clips of guys being wide open and him not pulling the trigger. But having watched the entire game, what was your overall assessment of Aaron Rodgers in this game? Well, I think I, I said the strongest words, so I, I feel like I'll go first. Um, we all know this was not Rodgers' best game. This wasn't even, you know, in his caliber, what we would call a good game. Um, it was probably for many teams, it was probably just good enough to win. Um, but this team isn't built that way. Your special teams aren't built that way. You know, when, when you have a high paid dude like that, there has to be sacrifices elsewhere on the roster and your team is built for Aaron Rodgers to win the game. And he just didn't get it done. Um, we all saw the, the, the double team to go out to Adams. Um, when you had 
essentially what boils down to a backside outside backer or a will backer absolutely lost in coverage when he uh when he drops off of Lazard and he goes to double the wheel out of the backfield that's already taken by a banjo um that's a poor decision but it wasn't his wasn't even close to his his only poor decision of the night you know if it boils down to one play fine you know you live with that I thought there were a lot of times when what the Packers do well and what Sam had kind of alluded to is they usually have some sort of vertical look and then some sort of quick game look. And I thought quick was there just about all night. Um, but for whatever reason, it was still shot, 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 you know, um, hero ball is what we call it in high school. And you can't do that, especially with active safeties like, like San Fran had. Um, I didn't love that. Now, it's not as strong as my words were initially because when I went and watched the protection again, um, he didn't have a ton of time. But the bigger thing is he didn't have a ton of direction. San Fran did a great job of holding top of pocket, not letting Rodgers get out, make these off-scheduled scramble drill throws that he's been so electric in in the past. Um, they did a really nice job of understanding we're going to have 1.7 seconds or less to get to him. Otherwise, it's contained and collapse. And they were very very disciplined on that um you saw a couple of times in the red zone and then um one outside of it you know zero yard sacks one yard sacks whatever that might be um they're not these huge you know 16 17 yard losses but what they are doing is showing that there's absolute contain there and not allowing Rodgers to get through those uh progressions when he can slide off schedule so not a great game by him I mean bottom line yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I mean, like Coach said, they were forcing him to stay in the pocket and, you know, make plays from the pocket, and he couldn't do that consistently enough to win. Um, one of the videos I put out recently, I kind of went over a couple plays that I thought he missed that could have really changed the direction of the game. One was a play, just to run over them real quick, one was a play right before the Mercedes fumble where he basically had Deguara wide open on a post that – with the ground speed could have gone for a touchdown. At least it would have been in the 30 or the red zone. Um, the very next drive, he has Cobb in almost the exact same situation on like a middle read dagger concept um, where he gets behind the linebackers. And it's, a, it's it would be a first down where in the actual game, they just went three and out there. And, you know, they bring in Cobb, you know, he demands to trade for Cobb if he's going to come back and you won't throw to him in these high pressure situations. It's, right. it's crazy. And then the third one, which was honestly might've been the worst one was um, Packers were one in like a three curls concept um, on third and long, which I, I don't love. It's kind of built to attack cover three, but they, they attached a uh, flat route from DeGuara, which um, when the 49ers, they were in man coverage, it was a rub route. And so DeGuara was running wide open for the third down and Rodgers looked straight at him and did not throw him. And it was just, it, watching it about the first couple of times, it, it was pretty, pretty annoying, honestly. I mean, there were, there were throws to be had. Like if, <laughs> I don't want to be too strong here, but after the first couple of drives, it might've been better to have Jordan Love in there. If, as long as he's able to make the throws, <laughs> that are there for him right no read him out and make the throws that are there for him got a little warm in this office all of a sudden what's (laughs) yeah i know i've been sitting on that take for a little bit um (laughs) and i I like jordan love i'll admit that um obviously he's nowhere near the in in general he's nowhere near the level of quarterback rogers is yet um but if he's able to operate the offense from the pocket that's what aaron Rodgers wasn't able to do and so it might have been at the very least not not a worse option than what Rodgers was giving you yeah and it's, it's actually interesting you say that I, I know that's obviously a controversial take because of Jordan Love and all that stuff but it's really something that I've been saying kind of for a while is is what Matt LaFleur wants is a guy that can just you know follow what I'm giving you follow the offense as it's laid out and you know the the real frustrating part is it worked the offense worked the plays worked there's a guy it's it's third and seven there's a guy running eight yards down the field and he's open and for some reason, I don't know, Coach, if you have some thoughts on the psychological aspect of this, Rodgers is smarter than this. He's better than this. And, and he's just, he's got some kind of a mental block. And to Sam's point, it's not that, you know, love would be better because he, he's clearly not better, but you don't need to be a great quarterback to just hit the, 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 the play design. It's designed to do this. It worked. He's open, throw the ball. So I, you know, again, I don't want to get into the drama of Jordan Love versus Aaron Rodgers, but I think the basic point of, um, the frustration with Aaron Rodgers because it's it's there and it's available and he's better than this 
But also it, it does kind of segue into, I want to talk a little bit about Jordan Love in terms of his fit in this kind of an offense, which can be, um, you know, you don't need to be Aaron Rodgers to run an offense like this. You don't need to be, a, you know, hero ball type of guy. Assuming everything works out right, you just need to know what's expected of you. This is the play design. This is what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if you know what you're supposed to do and can do it, I think he can execute. So first of all, coach, I, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that in terms of, again, the psychological part of why a guy, and, and you kind of talked about it in terms of you feel like you got to put everything on your shoulders, right? But what, what is it about a guy like Aaron Rodgers that the simplest thing that, that I can see, and I don't know anything, he's just, he's not seeing, he's completely blind to it. Well, I, I certainly can't play psychologist, especially to somebody as as brutally intelligent as Rogers. Right. But I guess if I were to venture a guess, I would say it's because he's done it before. You know, you think of all the magical games he's had. You you think of the the Cardinals, the the game that they lost to the Cardinals in overtime in the playoffs, and what he was able to do there. You think about um, all the Lions games and, and that that Cowboys game where. Um, they marched on the field in 36 seconds. Like this is, it's all stuff that he's done before, you know? So there may be a pause. I don't know, but there may be that thought of, of I can do this. Like it's, it's a, all in a day's work to me on top of, you know, this is the team that was supposed to draft me. This is my team yeah. growing up. This is, you know, that I'm sure all of that plays even a minute part. It plays a part right now. We're coming at Rogers here. We're coming at love here. We're going to have some, some questions on that, but I do got to say, your receivers are not scot-free in this whatsoever. Big drop by DeGuar on sure, second down. Right. That that changes, to me, that changes the trajectory of the game. You're putting a drive together, now you're at third and ten. That's not good. Obviously, the Sadies fumble. There's a couple of route concepts where you have two dudes in the exact same zone, and that's not what Green Bay does. I mean, they're so good at divorcing your zones. So if you can't get those zones to divorce – you might as well play zone coverage all night and only bring four, right? Like Sam Fran did a good job of not getting ahead of themselves and being like, well, if, if they're going to screw up, we're going to take what they give us, you know? So there's all that sort of stuff rolling into it, but it's kind of that perfect storm of yuck. So I want to stick yeah, on that. For, I, for, for, oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I, I agree. You know, I was kind of, you know, get going in hard on Rogers a little bit there, but I agree. It's, he was far from the only right. um, underperforming player. So, I want to remove the names real quick, Rodgers and Love, because, again, the people are going to freak out if we, if we go too into that. But let's just say, Coach, again, you've got one guy, he's, he's a student, and he is unbelievably talented. I mean, he's, he's going to go off and do special things in, in college somewhere. But he just, like you said, he, he's got it in his head that he can do everything. And sometimes he just won't follow the instructions and wants to take that shot. And then you got another guy, he's not, not that talented. He's probably not going to get a scholarship somewhere but he can follow instructions and he can execute the offense and he can move us down. Is there a part of you in your head that says, maybe we should just move on with the other guy. Maybe we should, maybe, you know, I, I, is there a part of you that kind of prefers the guy that's just going to listen and do what he's told as opposed to the superhero that can do magical things, but just will not follow your instructions. Yeah, this is an excellent question. And one that every high school coach and college coach and pro coach in America has, has gone through, has, has beat their head around. The way that we addressed it, and we were in this situation not long ago where we had an exceptional athletic quarterback, could do amazing things with his feet, probably the most gifted feet I've ever seen in high school, um, made some throws, made some real nice reads, could, could do that, but also had a tendency to play hero ball, right? And then we had a cat coming up who just quite frankly wasn't an athlete, but would do literally everything you told him to. Right. So we've been in this situation before and the way that we attacked it, I don't know what the Packers do, um, you know, Monday through Thursday, well, <laughs> Monday through Saturday for NFL teams, but I don't know what they do in practice. The way we attacked it is we're, we just said straight up, we are going to make practice when we go one V one, we are going to make, you know, our ones and, and the defenses ones, we're going to make it as anxious as possible. I will intentionally call the wrong protection. You know, I will, um, intentionally set you up for failure. I want to see how you handle these high anxiety situations. And I'm going to do it again and again and again. And I'm going to make practice the most anxious time that you're going to be in all week. So that game can slow down. I don't know how Green Bay does it. I wouldn't think they do that after 16 years or so of, of seeing magic from Rogers. But in the back of your mind, you got to be thinking like, oh, what, what else do we have? And the same token, you know, the, the way that we approached it was, hey, this is the guy that got us here. You know, this is, I mean, 
you don't want to say we ride and die on one guy because you certainly don't in football, but who gives us the best chance to win? And nine times out of 10, 99 times out, uh, out of 100, it's the cat that's been doing it. Yeah, so I, I want to attach the name back on real quick before we move off the position. But as far as Jordan Love, we haven't seen very much. And, and obviously, it's not true that Aaron Rodgers never follows this structure. And, and obviously, you need to do more than just follow rules to be a good quarterback. But as far as what we have seen from Jordan Love, is there anything that you guys have seen that, that you did like and that was positive and that gives you hope? Or is it just kind of cringing the whole way through and hoping that something changes? No, no, goodness, no. I love Aaron. I love it. Uh, well, I love Aaron Rodgers, but I love Jordan Love. <laughs> I like what the cat's got. He's smart. He's calm. He's, he's poised, right? He's very composed. He's got a great level head on his shoulder, which goes far and away um, for a young quarterback. That is probably the, the best thing you can have is being calm and, and being composed. And let's be honest. I mean, this cat's been hearing it since he got drafted, you know, how, how you're, you're not going to be Rogers. Why would you're a waste of a pick? You're this, you're that. When you actually get into a game, be it, you know, scrub time or, or you got to sub because your quarterback's out or whatever that is. He's just taking daggers left and right. And the cat still shows up to work every day, still works hard. You know, that's, that's a huge piece of it. And I don't know why I'm going so like mental savvy today or whatever, but like, that's a huge piece of a young quarterback, the, the face of the franchise type guy. I'm excited to see, you know, whenever he gets his time, wherever he gets it, I'm excited to see him. I think he's got some natural ability. He's not Aaron Rodgers, but he's got some natural ability. He, he can make some good throws, and he's just so calm, just so poised. He, he doesn't get rattled. I love that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Everything I've heard about him says that he's just got a, he's got a pretty special mental makeup, regardless of what his on-field play looks like. Um, and with regards to talent, I mean, you watch some of his college highlights, and he he can, he can sling it. He can run. Um, even if he doesn't like Aaron Rodgers has an insane, like probably the best release ever insane arm strength, but you don't necessarily have that or you don't necessarily need that to win. Like he, he's got enough tools to win. The main question I think is, you know, can he play within the system? Can he, he avoid turnovers and then grow from there? And, you know, with that, I also think there's been some growth. I'm, I'm not a quarterback expert or, I haven't studied mechanics in depth or anything like that, but one of the things I noticed when watching these games that he's played in the regular season, whether it was the chiefs game, getting into the lions game, he has been pretty careful with the ball. Like even compared to what he was doing in preseason, at least with like down the field kind of reckless throws. Um, Yeah. I'm, I'm honestly excited to see where he goes uh, with his career and what comes next for him. I'd yeah, we've definitely throw. seen him make professional throws. Um, yeah. it, you bring up the preseason reminded me, I went to that Houston game preseason. I watched him take uh, under center a five step drop, which is kind of tough to do, off of a turn your back play action, and then hit a, an eight yard glance to dig. And but you're looking at you know 13 yards, 15 yards ball travel with some pretty nice velocity in a great spot, splitting the safeties right over the top of the Mike Backer. Like, those are professional throws. Dude can make professional throws. It's just like you're saying, Sam, how can he develop? How can he grow to the mental aspect? Cause you got to understand with Jordan love, no matter how much he's practicing right now, these aren't live game reps. So I don't think you go to our four system right away or whatever that is capped on cap rules, do something special when it all breaks down yet. But I think he has the ability to get there. Yeah. And a couple quick yeah. points about that Kansas city chiefs game too. I mean, he was under constant duress. I've never seen, a quarterback in, in a Green Bay uniform get hit or scared at least that much in, in quite a long time. But one of the other funny things is I remember one of his completions, he had about a half a second to get the ball out of his hand and he's getting hit. And as he's falling away, he throws the ball and he actually gets a completion. And it, it, it was, I think when we all watched it, it was just kind of, a, oh, this is just a disaster. But it was, it was another one too, where it was like, if, if it wasn't such a disaster of a game and if that was Aaron Rodgers throwing the football, that would be a highlight. That would be one of those things like only Aaron Rodgers could make that throw. But it was Jordan yeah. Love doing it. I mean, it was impressive to to not just see somebody about to hit him, curl up in the fetal position and say, get me out of here. No, he's keeping his eyes down the field. There's a guy standing there, throws the ball, completes a, a, a pass and goes down. I mean, it's it was actually pretty impressive that he was able to pull that off in the heat of just a complete disaster of a situation he was in. Anyways, um, I want to move on quickly to wide receiver. Um, the, the only thing I'm, I'm kind of curious about, if you have any additional comments about the, this particular game, feel free to throw it in. But 
I want to kind of look into the future a little bit. A lot of these guys are up for, um, they, they may just be gone. We don't know about Devonte MVS, Alan Lazard, whatever, but clearly we know what Devonte brings to this team. But if you guys were running things and knowing what you know about Matt LaFleur's offense and his system and the different makeup of the different guys, you got Alan Lazard, you got MVS, even throwing Amari Rogers and some of the different things that all these guys do. What, it, what is sort of the bigger building piece for you who, who are you looking at forget about contract and age and all that other stuff just in terms of ability what is a more cornerstone important piece is it an mvs or is it an alan lazard or somebody else are we excluding Devonte adams we are or... excluding Devonte. yes okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. you can go coach um, yeah in that regard if, if we're excluding Devonte, i'm going alan lazard i love his physicality i love his frame i love his hesitant or his non-hesitancy in the blocking game I mean this cat can catch he can make some moves out in the field great whatever um anytime he's in the game I can be in zero personnel I can be in 10 personnel 11 12 it don't matter um I feel perfectly comfortable getting him in a condensed set and letting him chip off of a five tech d end let him cut on the backside of trap whatever that might be um I'm going I would put all my chips in on Alan Lazard yeah, I, I would tend to agree. Um, just all the things he can do, you know, he can take jet sweeps, he can block, run routes upfield, whatever you want him to do. Um, and then with, you know, obviously within Matt LaFleur's system, there's value in having that receiver who can do both, who can stay on the field on every down. Um, MVS, his speed is obviously really valuable, um, but you can you can find speed in the draft in that in in that sort of area. So with that said, if, moving forward, if you had to pick a wide receiver to add to this offense, if there's something that's kind of missing, what is what is like a big component that you wish that they had? Y'all remember it back in the Heinz Ward, Steve Smith days, uh, Donald Driver made a, a living off of this. If you can get that guy who can line up in the slot mm-hmm. and then bring Tay off and be on the line in the slot and be a bully, um, that really changes things for you defensively. You know, you're not so you're not so fast to go to nickel and dime then, you know, and if, if you're going to keep that personnel set, um, if you got just a, a, a bully type of dude in there, that big, nasty dude that can lie. Well, not big, but just nasty. I mean, I, I picked Heinz Ward. I picked Steve Smith and I picked Donald Driver because physically, I mean, they're, they're big ish dudes. They're not a speedster. They're not going to outrun you. They're not, as Sam said, taking a jet around whatever it is. But they're just bullies. They're nasty and, and they're tough dudes. They have no problem going over the middle and they really make you think twice about putting a, a, a nickel or a dime on the on the field because they're going to physically beat them. Yeah, I mean, if I like looking at, you know, the free agent wide receivers this year, for example, I would love someone like Chris Godwin who can get that physical blocking in there, um, kind of like Lazard. Um, and then can also attack that middle of the field, be a, a versatile weapon in that way. I guess what I'm telling you, Ryan, and I guess what Sam's telling you is if you get a chance to draft Heinz Ward, you should probably <laughs> draft Heinz Ward. I'm sure everybody is always on the lookout for the next Heinz Ward. I don't, I don't think there's any yeah. doubt about that. All right, let's, let's go over to, to offensive line. I'm going to just kind of pair this with running back. I don't have any running back specific questions, but we'll, we'll look at it in terms of running game as well as just the overall offensive line. We know we've got David Bakhtiari. We know we have Josh Myers. We know we have Elton Jenkins, although we're not entirely sure where he's going to play next year. But similar question to wide receiver, moving forward with the offensive line, what is it you'd like to see? I mean, we know that there were some struggles with injuries and depth, and, and there was some talk about the run blocking in certain areas maybe not being super great, but uh, again, you got a magic wand. What is the one position, the one guy, the one whatever that you wish that this offensive line had to help this team get to where it needs to be? I think that all rolls. This is such a cool question. It all rolls on the back of Elton Jenkins. You know, mm-hmm. how is he? Is he going to be the same player he was? Because if you got that road grader right guard, who's also a road grader at center, who's also a road grader <laughs> at left guard and a road grader at tackle, like, you know what I mean? Like that's that's such a key element. And you saw so many offensive line um, deteriorations and now all of a sudden everybody and their mom has the blueprint on how to beat the Packers O-line now you know you sim pressure you lock them in man you know and you attack upfield and you twist underneath it that's what San Fran did pretty much all night and showed Dennis Kelly and Lucas Patrick um, some really really tough things so running wise um, get you a bully you know get you a a bulldog I think you're going to be just fine tackle wise to be honest with you um, I think your center is going to be 
the center that he was when he does come back, just get a road grader, man. Um, and ideally you get a road grader who has feet like Trent Williams. But again, I'm telling you to draft Trent Williams. Like <laughs> what I can, yeah. what, what I'm telling you, man, is I'm just draft all the future first ballot hall of famers. Like, sure. I don't know what else. Yeah. Um, easy. But uh, again, you know, get, get that dude. Who's got that nasty, right. Um, you can probably still find those dudes a little later on in the draft. You know, they are there six, seven. I mean, look at what Stenovich did with a couple of corn dog salesmen. Essentially, they came down from the stands and played lights out on this offensive line. Right. So you've got the system in place. If everybody stays, you know, if Buckus stays, if Stenovich stays, wherever that shakes out, you got the system and the dudes to do it. Um, give them a little bit of physicality. I love what Goose had mentioned in the chat. I didn't come around to him. I apologize, Goose, but uh, Logan Bruss from Wisconsin, he can be a dude, you know, so take a look at some of those guys, you know, even guys who played tackle in college that you could turn into a road grader or a guard. Yeah, I, I would agree. Some, someone on the interior, I haven't done any scouting really yet. Um, so I don't have a name. Um, I will say though, that once, once the package get healthy, I really like what they've got in their O-line room. Like you got run in the tackles are pretty much set. You got Myers. I think Newman, you know, if he builds some strength in the off season, works on that mental aspect, you know, picking up those stunts and twists. I really like, you know, his ability to work with his hands and in pass protection. Um, and then obviously Elton Jenkins, you can just slot him in where the worst position is of the, of the guys you've got out there and, you know, pretty much instantly get an improvement except for maybe like at Bakhtiari's spot. Um, but yeah, I think it all depends on getting healthy, um, add some interior talent if you can and you see where you are. I mean, well, what a have... dream that is too for Stenovich and Buckus, right? right? What I would do is the first preseason games, I would put all my starters out there except for Jenkins. And then those first three preseason games, I would find who graded out the worst, who I didn't like the worst and be like, all right, Elton, you're playing right tackle <laughs> this year. Go have fun. Yeah, what exactly. a freaking luxury, you guys. You don't understand right. how cool that is. Yeah, right. and I, I was thinking earlier this year, has there ever been an offensive lineman like that? Like who can play at a borderline all pro position, all pro level at all five positions? It's just insane. So I, I, I do want to touch a little bit on running back, just, just in case you guys have any, any uh, comments on it. But do you have any issues with our running backs, either A.J. Dillon or Aaron Jones, or do you feel like they're, they're going to be fine? We just need to get a little bit of help in the offensive line. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think they were fine without help on the offensive line. Fair you know, enough. Things that, <laughs> the things that they can do. Right. Um, they are the two dudes that you want in this scheme. You're right. running primarily wide zone. You're shaking it up with a bit of trap. You have to stay sound D gap to D gap, or these guys will gas you on top of that. You've got leak. You've got wheel. You've got, you know, Texas routes. Um, these cats are good. I wouldn't shake up the running back room at all. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement. I really love the the complimentary styles they've got in there, the the versatility that they've shown. Uh, they just get just get healthy, and I think they should be good to go. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really expect any issues, but I didn't want to just assume either. So, um, I'm I'm gonna man, we're flying through here. Time flies when I talk <laughs> to you guys, so I'm, we're just gonna skip ahead to the defense. If you, if you want to touch on tight end or anything else, feel free to do so. But starting with the defensive line. Um, it's kind of hard to really shake it up too much because they're, they're kind of thin as it is. If you start talking about losing Tyler Lancaster and Dean Lowry and whatnot, and obviously Kenny Clark is, is, is locked in, but let's just start from a, a talent standpoint. Um, what, what do you guys see in the defensive line? What do you like and dislike? And then moving forward, um, assuming that we don't end up keeping these guys where they are, which is a pretty safe bet. Somebody's going to end up leaving. What would be a, an, an ideal player, um, to put next to Kenny Clark and in, in terms of different styles of defensive tackles for this scheme. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead, Sam. This is, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Kenny Clark's Kenny Clark's a beast. Um, yep. Besides that, I would love to add another interior pass rusher. I feel like the guys they've got in there right now are a little bit one dimensional. Um, I mean, sure. Lowry, he's given us some pass rush this year, but it's tough to tell if he'll be able to replicate that in, you know, in, in coming years, if he even, is on the Packers still right because he could very well be a cap casualty Tyler Lancaster I mean he's very very limited he's right. he's big and he's strong and if you put him in positions where he can use that to his advantage you know just taking up double teams that kind of thing I think he can you know give, give you at least average play on the defensive line um honestly in the 49ers game I thought he he played pretty well just uh getting some of those double teams uh and 
using his strength to his advantage. Um, with Slayton, kind of the same deal as Lancaster, except he, I, I think he has more potential, more athleticism to be a, a, at least a average pass rusher, give you at least a little something like that from like a nose tackle position. Um, from a, from like looking at the draft, like I said, uh, a pass rusher, I would love to see them add another guy like that. Kind of, kind of what Kiki was supposed to be, but you know, obviously he's no right. longer on the team. Um, and then just kind of fantasizing about it. I, I would kill to see Jordan Davis alongside Kenny Clark. That dude is just insane, <laughs> man. You, you could run like you could run line, light boxes all day and just, just destroy people. Yeah, I mean, if we're living in this perfect world scenario that you got, uh, Jordan Davis would be amazing there. You're absolutely right. Um, I don't think, unless you trade Rodgers and get all the number one picks, I don't see that happening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I guess my question to you, Ryan, is in defensive line, are we counting your quote unquote outside backers as the linemen as they tend to play? Right. No, yeah, I'm, we'll, we'll save that as a separate question. Okay. In this scenario, what I would do, um, one thing, and I'm probably going to get, you know, stabbed in the neck walking down to Quick Trip for saying this, but one <laughs> of the really cool things that both Capers and Petten did was have a NASCAR package, yeah. right? So this is something that Texas did phenomenally a couple of years ago with Clowney and J.J. Watt. If you can line one of those cats up, think, think if you get Preston in a three-tech and Kenny Clark is a backside one. And then you have Whitney Merciless and, and Zadarius as your edges. And that's your D line. You know, you get into something like that. I don't, I mean, I think Elton Jenkins is really good. I would watch one-on-one -on -one pass pro between Elton Jenkins and Preston Smith all day long. It would be amazing. You know, so if you had some ability to pinch that down, get a guy who has one responsibility, close this gap and get the quarterback on runs, close the gap, get the quarterback. I think you've shown from a linebacker level and I'm sure we'll get there. This, the Devondre Campbell cat can scream all over the field. He can make your D line, right. And that opens up some stuff for you. So like Sam was kind of alluding to, go ahead and get yourself a dude who's not 300 pounds and limited. You know, you can be 250, 258, whatever it is, and be stupid fast off the ball, have a couple of rips and counters, and go get you the quarterback. Yeah. yeah and that's, I think, one of the reasons the defense was so successful in this game, because they kind of had those guys back. They were able right. to put those three outside linebacker packages on the field with Z, Preston, and Gary, and then put Clark in the middle and just destroy the offensive line. That's just fun to see, man. I know. So that kind of leads perfectly into my one outside linebacker question, and that is we have to assume that some of these guys are not coming back, and I, I think is a, a very strong possibility we won't see Zadarius next year. Um, even if, I mean, if, if you think about it, if we get Rashawn Gary back and Preston Smith back, the, the first thought I'm going to have is, well, you know, it's not as good, but – you're probably only playing two. We got two. So you're fine. You got your two, but hearing what you guys are talking about and, and knowing how successful they are. And also the way Zadarius is all over the, the defensive line and the NASCAR package and all that, if it was you and let's say Whitney Merciless and Zadarius are gone, is that still kind of a high priority, whether it be the draft or free agency? Like we should, we really need to try to get a, at least a third in here, or are you just good with two? I would, I would say, yeah. Um, I think from what I was, from when I was watching film, a lot of what, defenses or offenses were able to attack was those backup edge rushers you at least need to get an improvement over sure. what garvin those guys gave you what garvin and garvin and company gave you um i wouldn't be mad if they tried to bring whitley merciless back on a cheap deal i really liked yeah. what he gave the packers in his time here um but I, I think you do have to add at least some talent or you know internal development is also an option with garvin i, I saw some stuff i liked from him even though he wasn't able to get consistent pressure when consistently gets to run that kind of thing. Yeah. I got to disagree on this one. I think <laughs> if you're looking future here, you have much bigger needs than your outside backer room right now. Um, and let's be honest in today's NFL, if you have outside backer needs, you go to nickel, like there's it. Boom. I solved it. If we don't have enough outside backers. Take them off the field. You know, we got <laughs> dudes in at nickel um, who can do that sort of stuff. So I guess that's kind of my thought process there. If you do go outside backer in the draft, I would put my priority on his special teams ability and experience far above his pass rushing experience. If you can get a guy who can give you a little something here and there in pass rushing situations, NASCAR package where he's getting six snaps a game, great. But if he can be a dynamo on special teams, he's worth every bit of that third round pick. 
So let's move on to inside linebacker. Obviously, Devondre Campbell was a bit of a phenomenon this year and what he was able to do. Um, Chris Barnes, not a terrible year, but massively overshadowed uh, in terms of what Devondre was able to bring us. Um, I have to assume, considering even with that kind of a year, he's still an inside linebacker, so his contract is not going to be, you know, $15, $16 million or anything like that. I have to assume they're going to at least try to prioritize bringing him back. But first of all, what specifically did he do so well? Because I know, well, he played the run well and he covered well. We know that. But what the heck did he do? I I mean, I don't even understand how how he was so good. But beyond that, and maybe it's the same answer to this question, if Devondre does leave, what are we looking for? I mean, what... What, what even is it about Devondre that works so well in this system? Yeah, I mean, like you said, he, he plays the run well. He covers well. Part of that is he's, he's a big linebacker who can really mm-hmm. move. And so those, those physical tools really help him succeed. But he's also a smart guy. He can shed blocks when linemen are coming up to the second level. He's good at picking up routes and coverage, passing them off. He's just, he's just a really good all-around player. So I would, you know, personally, I would try everything. Thing I could to bring him back like even above guys like maybe Rasul Douglas he, I, I think he he really ties the defense together ties together what Barry's trying to do um with Barnes I I don't know I he he's a little bit of a tough sell for me to just keep as a starter and he has some pretty clear limitations I think that mentally he sometimes isn't up to snuff. He's a great, I, re, I really like his ability as a run and hit linebacker. So I think that that his position as like a will linebacker. And if we're talking nickel um, kind of maximizes what he can do. I would love if they get another linebacker at some point in the draft who can kind of fill a similar role to Devondre. Cause the sense, the sense I get from watching Joe Barry's defense is that he wants to use his linebackers as a weapon. He'll, you know, at times during the season, He'll bring out Oren Burks uh, as a third linebacker in certain packages and just line him up all over the place. I think that he really likes that versatility that linebackers can bring, even with the limited personnel that he had. Um, so I would love if they could grab another guy like that. Yeah, Ryan, I don't know if you remember this or not, but before the season, when Joe Barry got hired, we took a deep dive into his defense and, and we consistently came to the point of this defense is going to run through the – well. I traditionally call this Sam backer. Um, sure. That's going to be your pivot point. And if you can get a good one and you can get him coached up, you're going to be phenomenal. Cause not only will he make the defensive line, right? He can also really, really help out the secondary. You can play some of that Tampa stuff. You can really feel comfortable spinning safeties, knowing that you've got your backside wheel accounted for whatever that is. Right. Um, so we really harped on the importance of the inside backer and the fact that Joe Barry was an inside backers coach for so long and really knew everything there was to know about the position there. So I think it was just kind of that match made in heaven with Devondre and Joe Barry. That being said, you can't take anything away from Devondre Campbell's intelligence. And I know you, you yep. picked on this a little bit, Sam, but the ability he has to snuff out the offensive play immediately, be it formational pre-snap or motions or just reacting off of it. So many times, guys, your defensive line was just straight wrong made the wrong read. You know, they're playing a little bit of read stuff where the read in the offensive line is supposed to stack track, fall back from a nose position, whatever that is. And there's Devondre Campbell there to make it right. And that so frees up your defensive line because they don't have to worry about just doing one job and plugging one gap. You know, they can play free. Same thing to be said for that will backer if you're in nickel or that strong safety if you're in your your base defense. I mean, there's so much that this cat does. Um, you can't <laughs> draft another Devondre Campbell. Like, I don't yeah. know what to tell you, right. The perfect fit for me in this Mike position um, that is filled by Chris Barnes right now. Um, a while ago, there was a, a cat, I think out of UCLA went to Jacksonville by the name of miles Jack. Like oh, yeah. this cat would be the dude. There. Yeah. He's a, just a downhill physical guy with, with some athletic ability with some talent there. So if you got a guy similar to that, I don't know what the comps are in college coming out. But if you got a guy who could do something like that, um, this defense could go from dangerous to Seattle level. Yeah. And one, one guy I've heard some good things about is Devin Lloyd out of Utah is kind of that sure. I, I've actually heard him compared to Devondre Campbell a little bit with his, his size and speed. I, I, like I said, I haven't really watched any tape, so I can't speak to the mental aspect of things. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. If you can get another guy like, like, like that, another quality inside backer, you know, like coach said, it's, it's easier said than done, but if you can do that, then I think this defense could, 
be pretty impressive to watch. Interestingly enough, Miles Jack was one of my first ever draft crushes. That was when I just started <laughs> watching the draft and I didn't know much, but I knew that dude was crazy and he was flying all over the place. I also love how we went from should we keep Devondre Campbell to we should probably keep him and then get a second one would be great too. So <laughs> yeah. we're just, okay, we'll do that then. That's fine. Just um, get a bunch of Devondre Campbell. Yeah. Three if you want. I don't know. This is why I don't help you out with draft stuff because my draft advice is so far, Ben, draft Heinz Ward, right. draft Devondre Campbell, draft Elton Jenkins. Like, I'm sorry. Dude. <laughs> All right. Um, what, I'm going to try in, in, in 60 seconds to go through two more positions. We'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> cornerback, um, really, really tough position that they're in with cornerback right now. Obviously, you know, some people are worried they're not going to bring Jair back. Obviously they're going to bring Jair back. That is priority number one, in my opinion, for the Packers, but you got Jair, you got Stokes, and we've also got Razul Douglas. And I know you mentioned that uh, a guy like Devondre is maybe a little bit more, um, important than a guy like Razul, but number one, um, how, awesome was Razul Douglas for this team and for this defense and, and, and what he was able to do. But then number two, what is, what is his role? If we assume Jair is going to be our number one guy and we assume Stokes is a guy that we've invested in, we believe in, we know his physical tools and ability, where does Razul fit in all this? Yeah. I mean, if I, if I was living in a perfect world and I could, if I had Jordan Davis on the defensive line and I could play light boxes all day and just stick a nickel, I would put Douglas and Stokes on the outside and Jair in that slot cornerback position. I think those are where their strengths are. And Barry does like to play nickel a lot. And so get, getting that slot cornerback, it's viable that you could you you spend some a decent amount of money on Douglas and he would still be a value pickup for you, right? You could you could have all three guys on the field of a fair amount. Um, but yeah, I, I think he's built to be an outside corner with his with his, with his uh, physical attributes. Yeah, uh, real quick answer. I think the reason that he was so good was Chandon Sullivan. Um, you get a nickel like that, and Joe Barry does like to play him um, quite often. It allows Razul Douglas to play free. He's not a disciplined dude. He's really not. That's why he's yeah. always put, right? But he has just got instincts. He's got ball skills. He's going to change a game for you. He's going to change four games for you like we saw this year if you can just let him play free. So if you got a couple of quality safeties over the top and you got a nickel like Chandon, you might as well keep Razul. Nothing against Stokes. I think he's done some great stuff, but I mean, you found what works. Yeah, yeah that's, that's that's cool. And a, and a rare shout out to Chandon. I like that because um, Ch Chandon is a really cool story as far as a, a kind of a no-name guy that came out of nowhere. But again, like a lot of these other guys, like I, I don't know why, but it just works. He just, he fits and he's doing a good job and he might not be the most athletically gifted guy or whatever, but he just, he just does his job every week is there's, I, I don't remember any games where I'm watching it going dude, Chandon just blew that freaking game, man. That guy was just horrible. I just don't remember ever saying that. That's not a thing. I don't think I've ever said. All right. He's the, go ahead. Yeah, they play Jekyll to, to Russell Douglas's high, right? Yeah. He can be that disciplined dude. Who's going to rally to the ball and give you high energy. And then Russell can just go play free. I did invite Chandon to join us on this podcast, by the way, and he did not accept my invitation. Um, I invited about 84 other people on Twitter to be here, and uh, I got zero responses. But I'm going to keep trying. We'll uh, we'll see who we can get on the uh, on the podcast one of these days. All right, safety. Um, it does seem as though, and I know Amos uh, seemingly started to kind of pick things up and, and was going in the right direction. But at the very least, Savage did not seem to have as good of a year as last year, and and uh, I, I would say arguably Adrian maybe wasn't quite as good as last year either. Um, what is your thought, first of all, on how they did this year, but also how does that tie into Joe Barry's system? Is it, is it maybe not as good of a fit? Is it maybe more complicated and they just need more time or what, what, what is your thought on, on how that all ties together? So with Amos, I mean, I, I kind of have to disagree on that. I've, I've thought he was phenomenal all year. Okay. Um, I, I think that, yeah, he, he's just a really good fit in the Joe Barry system where you've got the safeties who can kind of roam down on crossers and right. make plays down there. Um, he's smart. He's physical. He's got ball skills. He can play almost any safety position on the field. Um, Savage, I thought he, uh, he did struggle a bit this year. Um, specifically, he seemed to have issues tracking the ball at times. Um, 
it may just be a, a adjustment period while he gets gets acclimated to the defense. Because remember, Amos was already in a similar defense with Fangio in uh, Chicago. Okay. And so Savage may just take some time to get acclimated. Um, but yeah, I think Amos has been great all year. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Sam. You got two safeties who two years ago in Petten's system had it real easy. You're playing a ton of cover four, you're playing a ton of two read, um, you're playing a, a bunch of blue coverage. I mean, it's it's pretty easy to look pretty good when you just got to keep stuff in front of you, right? This year, um, they've been asked to do a lot more, a lot more on their plates. You got a lot of spin. You got a lot of involvement in the run fit. You are susceptible to play action. You know, you got to be a dude to play safety in this, um, especially that backside, what I call that free safety. Um, that's It's a tough role. You got to mm-hmm. spin to middle of field once you read pass and not allow anybody up and play that kind of top off cover three, cover one type of dude. But you got to make sure you read run. And if that's run your direction, you got to run that alley and fill and fit. And you got to rally to the bubbles. You got, I mean, they, they're asked to do a lot. And it's really hard athletically to come out of a spin, see a low hole crosser, and then reroute down to him. Like, that's a tough ask. So they've got a lot of, of they've got a lot more on their place. Joe Bar- Barry is asking them to do a heck of a lot more. Um, mm. But it's because he thinks they can. And yeah. who might have questioned Joe Barry at this point? <laughs> and I will say this. If Savage, you know, gets kind of acclimated more, his speed could be pretty insane to see in this kind of defense where he can just cut those crossers coming through the middle of the field just make plays. And that was largely what I was driving at because coach, you had kind of talked about that a little bit. I've tried to reference it a few times on my podcast, but I, I wasn't exactly remember specifically what you had said, but it was something to that effect of it's a much more complicated role. So it's, it's going to be difficult, but if they can get it, they can be the stars of this defense. you know, as far as, you know, the stats kind of go through the roof or whatever with picks or whatever, but it is a more involved thing. And so that's kind of what I was driving at, especially with Savage being a younger guy and being less experienced um is and, and, and who knows what he's going to evolve into if anything but there is reason to believe especially like you said sam with his skill set um that it's just going to take a little bit more time and with that time you may have a, a a real big star in in savage but we we definitely need to give the guy more time because of how complex as you said this this defense really is yeah i think the ceiling is um for Amos and Savage is probably Amos and Eddie Jackson in Chicago, okay, right? Sure. Where you've got Amos who can just, you know, stay, you know, just a steady presence. Um, and then you've got the playmaking safety who can just go around and wreak havoc. Well, guys, I, I, I really do appreciate your time. Uh, we could get into more special teams and do whatever we want. But we're already six minutes past time. So um, I, I just want to thank you. And I hope that we can have you guys on some more. Um, I, I, I'm positive that everybody would rather listen to you guys talk football than listen to me talk football, even on my own podcast. So anytime you want to jump on, you just let me know. But uh, again, thank you guys for your time and uh, you can find them on Twitter. If you guys want to do one quick uh, shout out once again, as far as where they can find you. But uh, after that, we'll get out of here again, guys. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks again for having us, Ryan. I could give my shout out on Twitter, but I don't put out half the content that Sam does to the extent that he does so follow him at Sam underscore D Holman he's exceptional yeah thanks man and I'll I'll throw it right back at you um you you put out a lot of great videos especially on YouTube I've really loved watching some of your your uh some of your breakdowns on there um inspired me a bit and so I would return the favor for you appreciate it thanks for having us right guy absolutely you guys have a good night yep take care